Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, sometimes even the future. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973. And I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. He also has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is packed with Beatles-related stuff. Um, And uh, how are you doing, Ken? How's it going? I'm doing great. Looking forward to this show. I think Darren should hold up that button for the entire length of our show. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV FM 90.7 in the New York area. He's been there since February 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Today's show is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, This is a button. Well, obviously, but uh, it is uh, the brand new Things We Said Today logo, which uh, is it backwards? Can you see it the right way? No, we're seeing it the right way. Okay. Um, This is a logo, folks, that you're going to probably start seeing a little more of in time, designed by a friend of mine, Anthony Giacone, who I went to high school with in New Rochelle, Salesian High School, where fellow Eagles, uh, and he designed this for us. And this is going to be our look, and a new Facebook page is coming, and this will be on it, and hopefully someday uh, we'll have physical buttons that you guys can get and uh, and other tchotchkes as well. So things we said today, I wanted to just share that look, uh, that logo uh, for you then. Please forgive the glare. Oh, look, Ken is reflecting in the record there a little bit. That's very uh, cool. So anyway. <laughs> oh, oh, look at that. Would you get one? No, I, I, I gave Alan and, uh, and and Ken one. But anyway. So today um, <laughs> we're having a special guest, Denny Sywell from the first version of Wings. Um, Denny was extremely helpful in when we were writing uh, the McCartney legacy. Um, he was, you know, we had a lot of great interviewees who were very forthcoming, but Denny was like above and beyond. And um, because of his diary and his wife Monique's diary really helped us establish the timeline that is inarguable because they wrote down what they did when it happened. So um, anyway, we'll talk to Denny in a few minutes, but first we have the news and Ken, our news department. But- <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Well, it's been a while since our last show, right. <laughs> since yeah. before the Fez for Beetle fans. So a lot has happened since then. And I apologize if some of this might be old news for you, but um, didn't want to leave out some important stuff. First of all, we begin by saying that Google announced that the Beatles recording of Here Comes the Sun is about to reach, get this, one billion streams in about a week from now it is the most streamed song in the beatles group catalog wow it has been since the very beginning you know for some reason and i think because it, it can make a lot of different playlists it fits a lot of different themes and it's a great song but um yeah it's amazing more than any other beatles song here comes the sun the big news regarding the Fest for Beatle fans is that it was announced that next year they'll be celebrating both the 50th anniversary of the Fest, when it was first known as Beatle Fest, and the 60th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America by having it take place at the new and mod TWA Hotel F at uh, JFK in New York City. And that will be February 9th, 10th, and 11th. Of course, February 9th, the big day when uh, the Beatles first appeared on the Ed Sullivan show, and that's where they landed. What a cool idea to have it there. Yeah. 
and I've been, I haven't stayed in, <clears throat> I've been in the hotel. Uh, really? I haven't really seen a lot of it, but it is, it's almost like a, a, a the, the mid, early to mid 60s um, freeze dried. <laughs> and still, you know, everything is mod and 60s and um, curved walls and, ceilings that you know that curve and it becomes the wall and you know it's very cool it's a great idea and um into an episode of mad men yeah exactly yeah yeah it, that'll be fun it's a good it'll be a good place and it'll be interesting if this will be a one-time thing or if they continue to have it there we shall see um Probably the biggest news, I think, in the past month, historically speaking, a tape of a Beatles concert from April 4th, 1963, when they played at a private boys boarding school in Birkenhamshire has come to light. The concert, nearly an hour long, was recorded on reel to reel on quarter inch tape by then 15 year old John Bloomfield. The Beatles were booked to play there. Uh, by David Moore, a pupil who wrote to Beatles manager Brian Epstein, asking if the group could play there. Epstein must have noticed the connection to a very important Liverpool family, the Moore's family who owned the Liverpool football pools and retail business. The Fabs okayed playing there for a fee of £100, and Moore's raised the money by selling tickets to his schoolmates. According to a BBC radio special for their show, Front Row, Despite the loud cheers and some screaming, the tape is not drowned out by audience reaction. The concert features songs from their debut album, Please Please Me, which came out just two weeks before this performance. The group kicked off the show with I Saw Her Standing There going into Chuck Berry's Too Much Monkey Business. The host of the BBC, uh, BBC show, Samira Ahmed, and our friend, Mark Lewison, are supposed to be the only people to have heard it after Bloomfield played it for the first time since the recording was made. Front row played a few seconds each of I Saw Her Standing There, Too Much Monkey Business, and Please Please Me. Regarding the significance of this tape, Mark Lewison said, quote, the opportunity that this tape presents, which is completely out of the blue, is fantastic because we hear them just on the cusp of their breakthrough into complete world fame. And at this point, all audience recordings become blanketed in screams. Right. So here is an opportunity to hear them in the UK in an environment where they could be heard and where the tape actually does capture them properly at a time when they can have banter with the audience as well. I think it's an incredibly important recording and I hope something good and constructive and creative eventually happens to it. I didn't even know this tape existed until you told me about it. And I think I had to pick myself up off the floor. End of quote. For this show, the Beatles are heard taking requests from the schoolboys who shouted out the names of the songs that had only been out for two weeks. All these years, Bloomfield kept this recording but never made it public until now. Wow. This was for the Stowe Boarding School. And Alan was kind enough to send us a list here he managed to get of what appears to be the songs that they played for this show. I'll read them to you. This is all in order. I saw her standing there at Too Much Monkey Business, Love Me Do, Some Other Guy, Misery, I Just Don't Understand, A Shot of Rhythm and Blues, Boys, Matchbox, From Me to You, Thank You Girl, Memphis, Tennessee, A Taste of Honey, Twist and Shout, Anna, Please Please Me, Hippie Hippie Shake, I'm Talking About You, Ask Me Why, Till There Was You, Money, and I Saw Her Standing There, Reprise. Wow. I mean, how long Since, is that? Well, that, for what I, more than a half hour, isn't it? It's supposed to be 50 minutes, around 50 to an hour. About an hour, yeah. Yeah. It's, and also, it's, sort of like, it's sort of like one of their BBC shows. Right. Know? Um, and soon after that, they were cut down to half an hour, and it was really just mostly stuff that was on the records that they played in concert. So this is it's an incredibly unique tape, you know. Um, probably, 
probably you know when the star club tapes were first announced there was there was that kind of sense as well that you know wow this is incredible stuff these don't sound great they don't sound horrible it's not distorted uh the vocals are very low in them but i think the you know the big hope is that um if they can uh get hold of peter jackson's mal software or <laughs> send it to peter jackson and have something done with it that maybe the vocals can be brought up maybe things can be separated um and we should be able to get a better quality recording than what was played on the BBC, which was still fascinating to hear, you know, I mean, it was really as short as the excerpts were and everything. It was, it was kind of exciting. Yeah. I mean, I've said this about the BBC recordings. I mean, 1963 was such an amazing year for what they did on BBC radio, because since they only had, you know, the one album, you know, of please, please me. They probably felt they had to have more material. Well, as as the years as the year progressed, and they did from me to you, and with the Beatles and everything, but they still felt that they had to perform other stuff that they hadn't released. So that's why sixty three in particular is such an, an incredible year in listening to the BBC recordings because you got all those other cover versions that they ended up not releasing at all, and right. so that's reflected in this concert. It also says here the tape runs out at this point after. I saw her standing there reprise, but speculation based on a set list written from memory by one of the Stowe people suggests two more tracks, Sweet Little 16 and Long Tall Sally. But um, exciting to hear, you know, years ago, Mark Lewison said to me, you never know what might turn up. <laughs> How do you know there isn't some Beatle fan out there that has a recording that they made from their early years and they forgot all about it or they didn't know where they kept it. And suddenly it turns up that could happen. All right. Um, Yahoo reports that Elliot Mintz, longtime insider with John and Yoko will release a memoir next year that will weave, uh, weave in behind the scenes moments with the famous couple, the U S publishers Dutton and British publisher trans world announced the deal with Mintz who first met John and Yoko in the early 70s and remained close to Yoko after John's murder in 1980. The book is currently untitled. Elliot is quoted as saying, I have waited 50 years to share my experiences with Yoko and John. Uh, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. It is a privilege to share my odyssey and include the reader uh, in, in an intimate portrayal of my two dearest friends. Mintz, a spokesperson and radio and television host, has worked on various John and Yoko projects over the years, including hosting, of course, the excellent radio series, The Lost Lennon Tapes, which featured unreleased recordings by uh, John. He has also served as a spokesperson for numerous other celebrities, including Bob Dylan and uh, Paris Hilton. Thanks to our good friend, John Bazzini. I mention him all the time here on this show. We learned that Legs Larry Smith, who played drums as a member of the Bonzo Dog Band, has just released a new song that's a tribute to George Harrison called O Kiyoki. That's spelled K E O K I. Kiyoki is George's name in Hawaiian. This can be found on Larry's new album called Mr. Wonderful. You'll recall that George wrote a song for Larry called His Name is Legs, ladies and gentlemen which you can find on his Extra Texture album from 1975. All right. Uh, also, this will make many of us feel old. April 8th marked the birthday of the first Beatles child, Julian Lennon, who turned 60. Julian celebrated with a dinner in Paris, and joining him to celebrate was Brother Sean. Julian thanked his record label, BMG, for hosting this lovely, called it Birdie Dinner. And Julian shared photos on social media with him and his guests seated at a dinner table. Speaking of Julian, he has just recorded a brand new version of his environmentally conscious song, Saltwater, that has just been released by the nonprofit label Future Youth Records. Playing on the record, former Wings guitarist Lawrence Juber, drummer Jim Keltner, and on keyboards, Steve Percaro. 
This is to raise money for the youth-led Think Earth Music campaign to raise critical funds for environmental justice for Earth Day, which was April 22nd. John Lennon's iconic song, Imagine, has just been added to the National Recording Registry of the Library of Congress. On April 12th, Librarian of Congress uh, Carla Hayden named 25 recordings as audio treasures worthy of preservation for all time based on their cultural, historical, or aesthetic importance and the nation's recorded sound heritage with Imagine being one of them. This past Saturday, April 22nd, was not only Earth Day, but Record Store Day, in which we had several releases of interest to Beatle fans. First, and maybe Denny Sywell might hold it up for us, you know, if we ask him to. The Half Speed Mastered vinyl release of Paul McCartney and Wing's 1973 album Red Rose Speedway. Also a white vinyl EP set of songs from the Give Me Some Truth compilation from 2020. Only 1,500 copies were made of that. Ringo's 1981 album Stop and Smell the Roses with six bonus tracks and the soundtrack album To Blind Man, which starred Ringo, the movie did, but doesn't have any Ringo songs, um, even though he recorded a song called Blind Man, which ended up the B-side for Back Off Boogaloo, his 1972 single. And there's also the band called The Stair Steps, formerly The Five Stair Steps, who recorded an album on George's Dark Horse label called Second Resurrection. And that came out on Record Store Day on vinyl as well. Quick hey. addition. You mentioned the um, Stop and Smell the Roses reissue uh -huh. uh, on Record Store Day. It was on CD and on LP. CD was a little tougher to find. Most folks obviously want the, wanted the double LP, uh, but it was available in both configurations. Okay. Just before recording this show, Darren, enlighten me to uh, a brand new album from Mary Hopkins which is coming out May the 3rd. It's actually Mary and her daughter, uh, Jessica Lee Morgan. And the album's called Two Hearts, which you can now pre-order. And just want to remind everybody, Ringo and the All-Stars will be back on the road pretty soon. Uh, that'll be, their tour will be in the U.S. May 19th through June the 17th. It's a West Coast tour. He's hitting California. Arizona, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and Utah. Altogether, 22 dates in all, starting May the 19th. Okay. That's all the news I got for you. Okay, so now we have a swirly thing, and we have our guest. Okay, so as promised, we have Denny Sywell with us. Um, anyone listening to this doesn't really need an intro to Denny, but um, for people, you know, born in the last five years or something, uh, he was the first drummer for Wings. Um, but you've heard him on all kinds of stuff from uh, John Denver albums and Astrid Gilberto. Um, he produced or started producing um, Cold Spring Harbor, Billy Joel's first album, but then was called back to work with Paul. Awesome. And uh, yep. we're, we're going to talk to Denny about is Red Rose Speedway because it's the 50th anniversary. It's an interesting album and uh, has an interesting story. And Denny was there. So hello, Denny. Welcome to Things We Said Today again. Thank you, Alan. Nice to see everybody. So just to set the scene, um, you had gone on the university tour and very shortly after the university tour ended, which was at the end of February 72, on March 6th, you went into the studio and started working on Red Rose Speedway. The studio you went to was Olympic. And um, I think people think that all of Paul's stuff or most of Paul, well, probably most of Paul's stuff is done at Abbey Road, but but um, for Red Rose Speedway, you actually worked in five studios. Yeah. Or really, unless you count mixing uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb, which was done at Island, but otherwise you worked at Olympic, Morgan, EMI, and Air. Um, right. And you recorded, if you were to guess how many tracks you recorded, what would you say? Ooh. 
Not as many as Ram. Right, but <laughs> it's it's pretty close. You recorded, yeah, I bet it is. You recorded 27 songs. Wow. It's oh, Ram only, was, was Ram more than that? Um, it was probably around that. Yeah. Um, I didn't go back and count those. Rupert up, but... the Bear, there was a couple of tracks for Rupert the Bear. That's right. A couple of tracks for the Bruce McMouse right. film and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, it's it's uh, you can see how um, it was destined uh, originally to be a double album. There was just so much right. stuff. Um, I never knew the complete story on that either. We We were planning on the double album. And uh, we we had sequences and everything because I have a set of acetates that Paul said, check this out. And if you like it, you know, let me know how, how the sequence sounds to you and, and how the mix is and stuff. So for some reason or other, they cut a set of uh, acetates of the double album. Uh, so there's four sides to it, you know, one side records only acetates cut at EMI. And I've been having them, they're, they're in my, my my private library locked under lock and key for 50 years now so um, anyway yeah so it was really a it was not a shock but it was uh, it was really weird that all of a sudden EMI says well we'd, we'd rather that you just released a single album for our second record and <clears throat> we thought we were going to really get epic here and, and release the big double album which had a nice flow to it the way it it was it really reflected the band where the band was at the time too so mm -hmm. so then we just said oh well let's keep emi happy and let's pick the best out of it and uh, make it mean something and uh, i guess it did cuz here it is the half speed master <laughs> 50 yeah. some years later yeah but you know when the deluxe box set came out and it included a reconstruction of the double album i think the double album was a much better album than the single album was um and uh, i you're think probably right yeah i mean and, and from what we gathered talking to you and uh is whoever else we spoke with about this plus looking at at, at things that you guys said at the time um it seemed that there really was a feeling on Paul's part and on all of your parts that the double album was intended to show Wings as a band. Yeah. And show that you're not just backup guys. There were a couple of yeah. songs that Denny Lane sang. There was Seaside Woman with Linda. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, everyone had a moment to shine. And I know that um, Henry, uh, Henry probably was the most vocal of all of you about his disappointment that it was cut to one. Um, but you probably all felt similar, I imagine. Yeah, yeah it was a little disappointment uh, rather than shock. Uh, disappointment, but because uh, it really was, because like, like you say, Paul really did want Wings to be known as a band, not a couple of guys that are playing with Paul McCartney. And uh, in the very beginning, when we did the university tour and the, the wildlife came first came out, I mean, we'd head down to the press office and we'd have to spend hours being interviewed and having pictures taken. He wanted the world to see us like John Paul George and Ringo, you know. And I thought eh, that's a little far fetched, buddy. But uh, you know, how do you how do you fill those kind of shoes? But that was his plan, so. Uh, when Red Rose Speedway came about, I mean, we'd started to be, you know, we started recording it after the European tour, if I'm correct. Is that right? After the university tour. After and the then, university. Uh, actually, and then the European tour came in the middle. Oh, were, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You worked towards to the end of March. Then right. then you, you did the European tour later in the year. And then in September, you came back and worked more on on Red Rose Speedway, because for one thing, he wanted he wanted to use the live high, 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 but just couldn't find one that everyone agreed was the one. And then you did overdubs on the live one. And then he yeah. said, well, let's do a studio one. Uh, and that one went on forever, uh, those sessions for high, high, high. No more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably got that from my, 
You probably got that from my diaries or my wife's diaries. That's right. Probably. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, those were those were invaluable for this because yeah. they helped us establish a her address. Uh, I'll give you her address. You can send a check to her. I mean, it's all okay. <laughs> a nice bottle of Perrier or a you know, grand some kind of champagne or something. <laughs> okay. okay. Um I should probably pass you over to Ken and we'll go around and ask questions. Ken? Okay. I just want to start by clearing up an issue you kind of lightly touched upon just now. Um, in the past, when I've interviewed you several times, you said that Wings was completely involved in selecting the material for Red Row Speedway, picking the material. Um, and oh. actually, Alan was was questioning whether you, you meant possibly the double album or the single album, because I know that you no, said to me single, you were con the, no, single. the single album. Uh, and first of all, we weren't ever involved with picking the material. Uh, Paul always brought the songs in. He wrote all of our music. So uh, the music we recorded as Wings was always Paul's song, even when we did uh, Love is Strange, someone else, a cover. Hmm. Uh, he brought the music in. No, what I meant on that statement, though, was when we recorded the double album, it got cut down. We were all in, okay, let's take the best of and make a single album out of it. We were all in that decision of picking which tracks would make the best single album. Right. And you were concerned about the flow of everything, yes. what yes. songs sag yes. together. Yep. It's even interesting because when you look at the double album as it was presented in the box set, there are certain songs that are segged together the same way that they're on the, the single album. Yeah. Yeah. You know, single pigeon into when the night big barn bed into, into my love. Right. Um, 1972 to me, even though you know, the Beatles prided themselves in talking about how they liked to release standalone singles and they didn't want singles to be part of their albums. They weren't the only ones that did that. A lot of artists through the years put out standalone singles. But in 1972, you released three <laughs> standalone singles and no albums, which I thought was really unusual. But you recorded so much material. What was the mindset for the band? Did they just think, oh, we're going to make a double album. We're going to wow everybody with so much material all at once. Because I would imagine sometimes it might have been difficult picking the singles from 1972, aside from Give Ireland Back to the Irish, which you had already, but Mary Had a Little Lamb, High, 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 you know, it could have been other songs that would have wound up on Red Rose Speedway. How did you go about knowing what would be the singles for the rest of the year? Was that just Paul's decision or did the band? Well, it was mainly Paul's, but uh, he would say something like, I think it should go and most of us would you know we would just say yeah i think that's probably a good idea mm. but if we didn't we had that the we had that that window of opportunity to speak us he really wanted us to be part of of all the decisions although i must say he you know he was the guy that that wrote the check at the end of the day mm. and uh, and he had the the uh, relationship with emi and what have you and he's the beetle, for Christ's sake, you know. <laughs> so who's going to say, nah, I think I know better than you here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a, it wasn't a dictatorship <laughs> by any means, but he listened. He listened carefully. We were all in on mixes. You know, we all had our assignments on the faders and stuff like that. But those kind of decisions, um, we had a say in it, but it usually came down the way he wanted it just because of all of them the aforementioned things yeah because i know i read in the mccartney legacy there was consideration that get on the right thing might be a single mm. with little woman love as as the flip side so yeah. um that I wanna, been, that, that, yeah that would have been a good single yeah i don't know in time to, you know looking back i don't know if that was as good of a an idea as high 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 mm. it's better than mary had a little lamb but because yeah. we're trying to be, you know, bring some rockers to the table when we go out and play live. And when Paul uh, sprung it on us that we're going to do a version of Mary Had a Little, it's probably the rockinest version you'll ever hear. Mary Had a Little Lamb, but it's still Mary Had a Little Lamb, you know. 
Right. Well, what am I going to say? Mm-hmm. Here's a couple of songs I just want to bring up from Vedro Speedway because um, in in uh, the McCartney Legacy it mentions that um, when the night yeah. was in the in the very beginning it wasn't really considered for the album and Paul wanted Aretha Franklin to record it. Hmm. I didn't know that. I love that track, by the way. It's it's in my drum book. Uh, I have a drum book called "What Not to Play," <laughs> <laughs> and I do I reference that track in it because the drum part, um, you know, when the night da, 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 it was one of those parts where you could just the drum part could be a halftime beat, but that that was kind of ordinary and uh, people people there was too much of that being heard. So I found this m- monotonous little thing where i go boom bap boom boom bap boom 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 bap boom boom bap boom so it just went round and round one two and three with the snare drum following mm-hmm. and it was a very like my buddy rick danko used to call it hypnotical <laughs> it was very hypnotic and uh it was a beautiful thing and then i used the halftime on the bridges or the other parts of the song so I particularly loved our version of When the Night. It was, uh, and, and a lot of drummers, I get a lot of emails from from drummers that, wow, that was just a, a very creative drum part. And uh, everybody loved the tune, but, it, you know, first of all, whatever part you create as a drummer has to fit, play, the, it's for the song. It's That's really what really matters here. You're trying to sell the song, not a drum part. Yeah. And you're drumming really, especially when I listened to the box set a few years ago, it sounds so phenomenal, yeah. especially on um, Get On The Right Thing. Your drumming, I love your fills <laughs> on that song oh, in Big Barn Bad, especially. Was, I believe that was recorded in Ram, the track. Yeah, original. Oh, get a, yeah. Yeah. But I'm just saying that if you listen to the box set, and especially the early mix of Get On The Right Thing, man. I'd love your drumming on there. It's phenomenal. Um, it's easy when you're playing with a master, you know. I mean, <laughs> you got a guy like that. In front. And you know what's odd about that whole thing to Ram and those tracks? I never saw Paul or heard, felt Paul playing the bass. He didn't even have a bass in his studio when we were laying down tracks. It was it was me, Paul, and either McCracken or Spinoza on guitar. And that was it. Yep. So. Uh, I got the box of records when it was all done. They sent me a little box of, I don't know, 20 records or something up to my apartment in New York. And the doorman said, hey, man, you got a box down here. I pulled it out. I went up. I put it on the turntable. It's the first time I heard the bass parts. And so my drumming, thank you for the compliment, my mm-hmm. drumming, uh, the bass drum influenced Paul's bass parts mm-hmm. by the rhythms that I played. And uh, that's really quite an honor. But it was the same with the Beatles, too. Uh, he used to listen to a lot of Ringo's just because he's a real musician, not just a bass player. He, You know, the bass and bass drums should be uh, making a stat- statement together. That's interesting. Yeah. That your parts were laid down before the bass. Um, about my love. Now, I've heard it been said, and it's also in the McCartney legacy, that Pete Bennett, who worked in promotions at Apple tried to convince Paul to release it as a single and Paul didn't believe in the song as a single. And Pete said to him, it's going to be a number one hit. No doubt about it. It became number that? one. That was uh Pete Bennett. Pete Bennett. Okay. Yeah. God bless. But, yeah. But um, I think it, that matter is cleared up in, in the McCartney legacy because Paul was watching the singles charts in the UK and he saw that there was a lot of glam rock singles that were in the top 10. So he felt my love would be out of place being a ballad. Did he ever convey to you that he didn't believe in the song or? No, how can you do How can you say that when your song's written about your old lady? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being facetious, yeah. but no, he, he never did. But we, you know, we were always, we were always in tune with becoming a better rock band because of the live show. Hmm. And here we are with Mary Had a Little Lamb and My Love, you know. And it's a beautiful ballad. I mean, I it's another one of those things where 
I'll get an email every once in a while. I say, how the hell did you play that part? And it, for me, it was it was like taking a nap. It was just so easy to come up with the the drum part for that song, and then just get a good execution of it, and it's and it's perfect for the song and everything. And I don't know. It was just I didn't think it was going to be such a big hit. But when when I'd be in New York and I'd be driving up to see my parents and. PA or something and I had to rent a car and I could go across the dial I'd hear Milo on every every damn station it really got uh serious air, airplay in the states and um, I didn't listen to that much music on the radio in, in England and the UK but uh, but boy in America it really got serious airplay yeah it was number one for four weeks yeah. in the United States I just wanted to make sure that Paul really you know thought highly of the song yeah. It's based okay. on what Pete Bennett said. That's all. Yeah. Well. All right. I think his <laughs> resistance would have been not not so much that he didn't like the song as that he didn't think songs should come off albums and be singles. That you know, which which Pete yeah. Bennett, you know, that's what Pete Bennett did. <laughs> and, right. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. I even saw that um he didn't want a single from Band on the Run. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy to think that way but that's you know that's how the beatles did things yeah very often a lot of their classic albums had no singles from them mm -hmm. darren yes um just to kind of backtrack a little more uh before red rose speedway to uh the time that wildlife came out um and we know that while well, actually, let me. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself here because I did want to make one fun comment in defense of Mary had a little lamb, which I always liked because it was a it was a typical wonderful McCartney melody that yeah. he would pull these things out of thin air, and even though it was a nursery rhyme, you know, it it, it worked as a McCartney pop song yeah, so that's well. True. That's true. But, Buddy Guy did Mary Had a Little Lamb before Wings did. I did not know that. In 1968, Buddy Guy uh, did his own kind of like, you know, Blues? adaptation, yeah, of Mary yeah. Had a Little Lamb. Wow. And it's on his wow. album, The Man in the Blues from 68. And it was covered. Wow. It was covered in the early 80s by Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble on their first album, Texas Flood. Yeah. So I always thought it was interesting how McCartney would catch flack for Mary Had a Little Lamb. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a different song, but it's on Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble's first album. Wow. You know, with Pride and Joy and all that, you know, those. Yeah, 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 yeah. My buddy Chris Layton playing drums on that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went looking like I, I didn't realize till, you know, years later that it was actually technically a cover that it was a buddy guy thing. And then one day I find it on one of buddy's earliest albums. And I'm like, see, Paul's Paul's taking crap for no reason with Mary had a little. <laughs> and, well, I, I always thought it was because he had his first daughter was Mary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mary ran, ran around the house as a three-year-old bip, bop, bip, bop, bip, bop, bip, right. this stuff. And I thought he was just paying tribute to her. And also that I heard there was, the first song ever recorded on that that metal spindle that recorded the music and those I don't know what it's called, it's but that was the first song ever recorded on the first recording, the Sheen. So he was paying tribute to that, but uh, so I never knew. But I'm, I'm I can't wait to, to hear Buddy Guy's version and uh, also Stevie Ray Vaughan's. Yeah, and a, a Man and the Blues is the name of the album from '68 right. from Buddy yeah. Guy. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah. To work to wildlife, um, wildlife sold well, and there's a lot of um, artists who would love to have their debut album crack the top ten in the U.S. Uh, but comparing its perform commercial performance to what Paul had already accomplished with Ram and McCartney and what the other Beatles were doing, uh, it was looked upon as being a sales disappointment. Was Paul? Did Paul wear his disappointment for the way the album was received on his sleeve, or did he just brush it off and move on? Yeah, yeah, the, the latter. Yeah, he never, he never showed disappointment because we gave it our best, 
and uh, you know how the public receives it is none of our business. If you're a true artist, you you write from the heart and you, you just give your best performance, and then the rest is up to the to the universe. Mm-hmm. So he was. Um, I think I didn't even know that he was disappointed with Ram, but he must have been disappointed with Ram. But I believe this is just me, but I believe that the people that the you know the Rolling Stone and all that just gave him credit with breaking up the Beatles, not listening to an album with an open mind. Yeah. Uh, could a single have helped Wildlife a little bit? Uh, if we were talking singles a few minutes ago, uh, if Paul chose to release something, maybe Love is Strange almost was the single. As much as I love Love is Strange, uh, I don't know if that would have been a single for that time. A wildlife would have been more of the single, and that wouldn't have been right either. Uh, there was some great song. Was tomorrow on that record? Yeah, yep. that was another great piece yep. of McCartney music. Uh, but there was no obvious single on that record, and five of the eight tracks on that record were first takes. Mm-hmm. We didn't mess around with it. that weekend. We went in and recorded the tracks, the basic tracks to the to that album. Then came back and did some overdubs and s- spent some time mixing and what have you. But uh, yeah, that, he just wanted to give the world a, a real honest look at a brand new band that was his new uh, his new Beatles, I guess, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then moving, moving forward as uh, Red Rose Speedway was coming together and, uh, you know, Paul clearly uh, was a very prolific writer going even back before you started working with him for him to have so much material for Ram and to be able to turn around within a year and change and come up with just as much material for another album, Red Rose Speedway. As as the album was coming together, it, it, it had to have been such a letdown to have come this close to releasing Red Rose Speedway as a double. It sounds like EMI pulled the rug out from under Paul at the last moment. Could Paul have fought the label? He is Paul McCartney, after all. And, you know, and said, you're going to get a double album from me or you're not going to get the album. Uh, could that have happened? Was that ever brought up? Did someone ever say, Paul, go tell him, go give him the business? Yeah, I don't know. We didn't we didn't take that stance as a band. But uh, I'm sure there's a lot of I think you're right there. He could have uh, stood up for his guns and. Uh, just said, no, this is made as a double album, and artistically it should come out as a double album. I don't know why that part the band wasn't included with. You know, it was when he went to see the suits at AMI, it was it wasn't the band tagging along <laughs> by any mm-hmm. means. Uh he just went in and, and did what he, he thought was right. And uh so yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, I I wasn't devastated. I, we were disappointed. I got to say that as a band, we were disappointed because, you know, it was the first time we we had any producer involved too. Well, we had a little little spell out finishing off Ram with Jim Gersio, but uh, uh, this was now when he went to see uh, Glenn Johns uh, and we had reco- recorded a couple of weeks at uh, at Olympic. It was a great room. It felt like Abbey Road. It really felt. It had that that big wooden room sound you know it was a perfect uh room to record it felt wonderful and a lot of mama's little girl and i, I remember you know we did uh, uh, tunes where henry ended up playing drums on the sea moon and uh single pigeon i think henry i was playing bass on single pigeon and trumpet you know we were like fooling around we were just having fun and i had no idea that Paul and Glenn weren't getting along uh, as far as uh, their ideas on what what music should sound like. So when 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 he was let go of of uh, producing or assist, associate producer of that album, I had no idea what was. I was having a ball because Glenn's drum sound, which was when the night, by the way, three microphones one one up here, one back there, and one out in front of the drums blended uh it allowed the drummer to blend his own sound and play uh with dynamics and uh 
I, it was the best drum sound I'd ever heard on me, you know, hmm. phenomenal drum sound. And uh, I, I loved all the, the exploration, you know, and uh, yeah, it was, it was strange. We really felt good about this album because we'd grown into a band uh, from that little university tour and the recording my, uh, the wildlife album. And, it, you know, it was really starting to feel 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 right and we were real proud of what we had mm -hmm. you know um, if, you look at, if you look at this list it almost looks as if you should have put out a single album before going on the european tour and then the other part of the double album after the european tour because, because this is what you did before you went to europe big barn bed when the night the mess single pigeon Tragedy, remember tragedy? You had sure. cover. Uh, Mama's Little Girl, Loop, the first Indian on the Moon, Seaside Woman, I Would Only Smile, Thank You, Darling, and Mary Had a Little Lamb. That's that's easily an album's worth of material. You could have, yeah, and it's very McCartney. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, and, that, and maybe that's why he made that decision too, though, because he wanted it to be more of a band. Yeah, that, but, might have, that might have leaned a little too heavily on the McCartney side. Well, it does have I Would Only Smile and Thank You, Darling, which were both Denny Lane and Seaside Women. Right. So, And it has When the Night, which was your fave. So, yeah. Um, well, Tragedy, I remember. That's one of the few tracks I sang on with my book bass voice. <laughs> but uh, Tragedy, you know, that wasn't it wasn't one of our better efforts. Uh Oh, no, I love it. It wasn't as good an effort as, uh, let's say, "Love Is Strange." Now that was really a for a cover. That was that was that was pretty uh, it's pretty solid, man. Mm. Um, I had one more one more quick question. Um, uh, we keep hearing about how Paul's goal with Wings was it to for the band to to work as a new Beatles, a dem democratic outfit where everybody played right. a pivotal role in the band. Yet, especially thumbing through and uh, reading Alan and Adrian's book, it's that old thing, money, that kept rearing its head that was seemed to be holding back from 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 the band being a a a equal a democracy, for lack of a better description. the The financial situations, which we don't have to get into all the meat and potatoes of now was something that seemed to be out of even McCartney's control, uh, at least, you know, to some point. It was. How long did it take for the band to begin to get a little grumpy about the money situation? Because okay. it couldn't have happened right away. It probably festered in time. Yeah. Uh, could Could you shed a little light on that main thing that really was – what was holding the band back from really being a democracy. Well, it, it's true though. There was the, the elephant in the room and uh, the elephant in the room was, we were working on a retainer that was one tenth of what I used to make. I used to have to fly to New York to do a couple of jingles to pay my American express card. So I could take the wife to dinner every once in a while. I took Paul and Linda, we took Paul and Linda to a restaurant one night in London called the Gavroche. And I laid my American Express card on and said, sorry, we don't take that. And Paul had to pay for the meal. But there were those, there were those elements. I mean, we were living on, I don't know how we lived. To tell you the truth, we were young and we were in love with what we were doing and the music and the band and what have you. And, and, uh, I, but I don't know how we got by. I went to the bank on the corner of the Barclays Bank and borrowed money to buy a used uh, car. So I'd have a car to drive around, an old Mercedes that I have a car to drive. And and yet we were at at, um, at Olympic Studios recording uh, Red Rose Speedway and Paul shows up in a brand new Lamborghini. And we all take a break and all five of us jump in this car and he shows us how powerful it is, you know. That was a faux pas. Not when we can't afford to. Uh, I'm living in a rented one-bedroom apartment, furnished, uh, 
in 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 uh, King uh, so Sydney Place, just south of uh, the South Kent Tube Station, you know, and and getting around town in cabs and and wondering when the next check was because sometimes our our retainer check wouldn't come because we didn't have a manager or an office. We had a room with a phone in it, but there was sometimes there was no girl there, hmm. and uh, you know it didn't come till. I believe Vince Romeo came along during the uh, the European tour, uh, and he acted as manager. And he didn't last very long, you know. But uh, it was it was we were there at the best and the worst worst times. And yes, the money became an issue, and it didn't take long until we saw that promises were made that were beyond his being able to keep as being part or shareholders of a, of a, of an organization, you know, just because of that, uh, mm -hmm. that court receivership. Yeah. Since we're talking a, a little about the money, um, maybe you should mention, because it's almost symbolic of, of all of that, um, the toilet in your flat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had this one bedroom. Oh, it was, it was really a, a shitty, uh, <laughs> London apartment, you know, it, was, uh, it would have been shitty in New York or L.A., anywhere. But if you walk to the back and there was a, 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 a stand up to a toilet in there that uh, on this above the toilet was this tank where the water it was a chain. You pull on the chain and the water came down and flushed the toilet. And the name on it, it was built by Thomas Crapper. <laughs> so that may be a that may be the beginnings of the Taking a crap, you know, yeah, crapper. <laughs> those, those are those are the kinds of toilets that they were able to hide the gun behind for Michael Cole. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you know, it could have come in handy. You never know. You might have had to hide something behind the yeah. tank. But yeah. anyway, but London, we I must say, I don't know how we did it. We we were always working. I flew back and forth from America on my own dime. I don't know how I did that. My expenses were never paid. I was never given uh, any help finding a place to live. We had no office. We had no help. We were just hungry to do what we wanted to do. And we loved the music we were making. And we would do it at any any cost. I mean, if I told you what what our salary was... And then later on, I heard that the, the Beatles were like that, that they used to walk around with 50 quid a week pay packet as walking around money. 50 quid a week was like $125 a week. You know, of course, if they wanted a Lamborghini or a house, they would just get it and sign for it and Apple would pay for it. But it wasn't the same situation with us. And, and eventually it did have a, an effect on the band. All right, Alan? That's... Um... Talk about another one of the um, highlights from some people's point of view and lowlights from other people's point of view on Red Rose Speedway, which is Loop, the first Indian on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. From what I remember of, of, of that, uh, Linda had just gotten her mini Moog um, and brought it into the studio. And I think it, it, all of you were, were messing with it, right? It wasn't just Linda and it, and it wasn't just Paul, from what mm -hmm. I gather. What? Not me. Not you. <laughs> Stick to my drums, yeah. But yeah, no, uh, yeah. And he he thought that that was jazz. You know, I, I thought that was really weird. And Jazz Street, whatever that was, I don't remember how that one went. But yeah, I actually we we uh, my trio, the Denny Shiwell Trio, the or organ trio, we did a version of Loop First Indian on the Moon, but mm -hmm. we did it as a jazz waltz, which was uh, really nice. Uh, I kind of like it. It's fun to play. It leaves a lot of room uh, structure-wise for, for stretching out and, and improvisation. But yeah, that those couple of, there were a couple of songs on there that maybe that's the reason why it wasn't a double album. There was a couple of songs that that didn't fit with everything else uh, as far as EMI was concerned. But, uh, but if there were some other things, there were things that, that didn't fit on the White Album either. Yeah. True. <laughs> right? True. That's true. I always went, when I heard, you know, from the box set, 
Red Rose Speedway, what could have been the double album, I thought, oh, it would have been Wings' White album. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Very true, yeah. Because, you know, adversity is one thing, but, I mean, we just, we had a lot more than just the the material we were recording. There were, there was there, there was a lot of different directions we could have gone there and that's that was made it really nice to be in that situation especially when you got a guy like like Paul writing the songs we could have taken them in a lot of different directions mm -hmm. um but loop did end up on the single album so um so yeah so pushed for it um uh from what i gather uh glenn johns that that was one of the things that really kind of set glenn johns off he thought that you know he'd he'd come right right after producing the first eagles album and all of these sort of very focused you know and a young group willing to listen to him and maintain the kind of discipline he wanted but then something like loop he just thought you guys were messing around and um you know, but you got a you got a really interesting track out of it. I'm sure that uh, that's probably the way he looked at it. Yeah, it doesn't being a not a connoisseur, but I, I understand as a producer Glenn's viewpoint where that that might not be the best choice mm -hmm. in that record. So yeah, I can see where that would. <laughs> would lead him off to saying, uh, well, I don't know about this, but, and Paul didn't like the word. No, I'll tell you that. I mean, he, <laughs> he didn't have many people around to tell him nah, no, nah, no, nah, that's not a good idea, Paul. Mm, interesting. Rightly so. Yeah. Was, so was Lou created from scratch? I just want to find out more about that because was it the day that you recorded? Was it just created on the spot right there from, from the band improvised or, had you rehearsed the song at all? Because it's just so wacky and experimental. I I believe it's it's exactly that wacky, experimental, and created on the spot. Huh. Yeah. So it should really have been credited to all of you. Oh well, writers. there's a few things. There's a few things like that that should have been credited to all of us. But mm. yeah, you know, what, what other ones? <laughs> Come on, I don't get the shovel out here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I'm, I'm, I helped uh, Paul with Little Lamb Dragonfly because we were at Trident. That's right. Yeah. And we were uh, that was recorded during Ram, and it, it was never finished. And uh, uh, I remember being down in the in the in the studio with Paul, and he was at at the piano, and he started playing a little bit of Little Dragonfly, and I said, "Oh, that we we should finish that. It's really a great. I love the tune and the orchestra and everything." He says, yeah, I don't know, man. So uh, I started making up, as he was playing, I started making up some background harmonies and stuff. And and uh, he went, oh, that's cool. Let's get the gang in here and, and put, put. So we, you know, it was simple stuff. I mean, I wouldn't take credit for writing anything here. It was any Anybody could have done it. But I might have spurred the interest to finish that tune off. And um, I even sang on it, too. So uh, that that was fun, though. But. Uh, I didn't get really, credit for it. I mean, <laughs> that's really a beautiful track. It is. Uh, Dragonfly. Um, but he was, um, I think he was originally saving that for Rupert. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then he would raid the Rupert file. <laughs> yep. And bring something back. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Do you remember in the session for My Love, there was this, the, the whole business of Paul having his guitar solo that he wanted Henry to play and Henry saying, just let me try once and then played the solo that's on the record, which is really a, a, a beautiful solo, really incredible. Yeah, and and it was singled out in all the reviews when it was released as a single. And uh, do, do you remember sort of wondering what the solo is going to be, whether it was going to go over and uh, you know, because you and Henry were really tight, I think. Yeah. Were you astonished by what he did? I was astonished by the final version, but I don't remember what happened there. I wish I did. I really do, because like you said, we were very tight. I loved Henry. And uh, uh, he, uh, within one take, he laid that solo down. That's the way I remember it, but I'm not sure if I'm correct in that. Uh, and it was that 
song and that soul that actually uh, when we were up in the farm in Scotland and we were rehearsing for Band on the Run, but we were also going through other material and My Love was one of them. So when we played it live, and I think that was the song that we were working on and Paul was just trying to get Henry to play it the same way every time because it was so iconic. And Henry's a very organic kind of a musician that doesn't like playing it the same way every time because he loves the, we all love the accidents, and, you know, but uh, I believe that that was the day that uh, I don't know if Paul was having a bad day. Henry was obviously having a bad day, but everybody was a little short tempered. Yeah. And uh, he got, we, you know, here we are living on a shoestring. And yet we're being, to, or Paul was telling Henry that he needed him to play this. Uh, a certain way every time we played that song and uh henry just freaked out a little bit and uh and paul pushed a little harder and that was the end of that and he left and when he left uh, it was no longer a band yeah it was it no was, longer it was band. something I left shortly yeah. after that after begging paul yeah. to get another guitar player break them in on on the on the part so he, we could continue on as a band just push the recording of band on the run back for a month or something like that but he wouldn't hear of it you know he said i guess arranges were made and emi spruced up their studio down there and, and all of this stuff and that was that yeah yeah the studio down there turns out to have been no great shakes yeah <laughs> Plus, I mean, I left the band the night we were supposed to go down there, and Paul got in trouble with the uh, with fellow on some cootie and the black mafia down there, and they said uh, you've been stealing a black man's music for so many years. I mean, uh, we'd like for you to say that you you've been doing that, and he wouldn't do it. And uh, they said we'd also like you to use Ginger Baker's studio one day. And uh, we'd like for you to use, you lost your drummer. So we'd like for you to use uh, Ginger Baker on drums one 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 day. And so he, as cheeky as he was, uh, he said okay to that. And he went and he recorded in Ginger's studio and he let Ginger shake some maracas on the track and then he wiped it. Mm. He's lucky to have gotten out of there alive. But that's, that's where I hear they got mugged or robbed or whatever you want to call it on the way home from the studio and that's the supposedly the only cassette or tape of the band our band rehearsing at the farm in scotland and well, somewhere well. in the universe there's a there's a two-track version of band on the run that's better than the album okay i wanted <laughs> to talk to you about it <laughs> Yeah, we'd love to hear that. And so uh, would I. I would pay yeah. good money for that. If so, somebody knows where it is, dig it out. <laughs> I think I know where it is. You know, what? you recorded that. You recorded the demos for that album on his Studer four track up at Ruth. Exactly. Up in so he they may have stolen the two track cassette, but those four track tapes yeah. are still in Paul's archives. So yeah. next time there's a band on the run reissue, he really could put out some of those those tracks. I hope he yeah. does. Love to well, hear I mean, love to hear the Denny Sywell version of Band on the Run, you know. It was good. Well, he played all my drum parts. Mm. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I wrote I mean, I created the part for the song. Mm -hmm. Not the opposite. And and he kind of went along with but I love the way he thought about drumming. He he thinks of drumming the way a drummer wouldn't. Uh, so as, uh, he wrote the material. So uh, it was very interesting. But he basically played the way I created the parts that we played on those songs. And he just gave his own little touch to parts of it. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so nice. From what you remember. Sorry, go ahead, Darren. No, very quick. Being because being that we're talking about Africa really fast. So you almost ended up going to Africa um, and you were going up until the last moments uh, when you decided, no, this is, I can't. What were your thoughts about potentially spending several weeks in Africa and, and recording there? Were you up for I, it or? 
Oh, yeah, fine with that. I have wanted to go to Africa. Are you kidding? Ghana and all of the drummers down there. I would have loved to have heard some of that stuff. I would have loved that trip. Uh, um, something happened the night that we were leaving. Uh, uh, and this is a little too personal, but I heard another bad piece of information about how we were being treated when we were a family and a band but not being treated like either one of those things. And when I heard that from a fellow band member who had just come down from Scotland, who had a baby and da 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 uh, I just said, you know, I'm in the wrong place here. Uh, I don't think my best interests are being looked after. And uh, it's one of my only regrets in life, actually, that I didn't sit Paul down and say, we have to iron out this this financial thing. I can't keep living a couple a couple more years and and, and making a, a McDonald's kind of a salary, you know, and being in one of the top bands in the world. It just doesn't make any sense. And it it would had a it had a, an adverse effect on me uh, personally when I left the band and. And I did some stuff that I wasn't too happy about, and I had problems because of it, and uh, and it led me to where it, where I am today, which is all great, you know. I'm so I'm glad I I just let it take its path, but it was the right time to leave, and uh, yeah, hmm. one of those things. Yeah, I wanted to ask from what you remember of the demo that you made of of Band on the Run. Um, Aside from what Paul had to add later on with orchestration and brass and sax with Howie Casey and all that, do you think the finished product as Paul released it with Wings was very close to what you had done on the demo? Uh, yeah, but but the demo, was, we had the balls of being a band hmm. rather than a bunch of overtubs. That's what I, when I was trying to ask him to postpone the recording and find somebody to replace Henry and re break some, a new guitar player. in. so we wanted to record it as a band because we felt like a band by then it was really coming on strong. And uh, he said, nah, we'll just do like Ram, do a bunch of overdubs. And I thought, no, oh, no, we just spent all of this time becoming a band. Why, why just do a bunch of overdubs again? So there was the musical rub that, I didn't care for, but plus the financial end that came into it. And, uh, mm. and that was my reason for saying, okay, that's enough. I wish it was different. I really do. I wish I would have ironed it out with them because I never, uh, I never played with, I've never played with anybody that, that I had such a connection with musically. And, um, and, you know, we could look at each other, while playing and and magic happened it was it was my whole time with with him was and he knew it and i knew it we were good for each other uh yeah that version of wings was a great team are there things on on uh red rose speedway single or double album version that you particularly look back fondly on apart from when the night because we've already mentioned uh, Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I loved a lot of this stuff. I thought that the medley was fun. That was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, where the heck is the, the album? Refresh my mind. Uh, Big Barn Bed was a... Now, somebody recently just mentioned that that was started during Ram. Well, because uh, um, in Ram On, which you weren't on because it's just Paul playing the ukulele, at the right. end of it, during the fade out, he starts singing Big Barn Bed. So, oh. so oh, that, that, that's okay. why you wouldn't have remembered it because it wasn't. Right. right. That's the only track, Ram On, that, that, that he played uh, Floor Tom Tom and the Uke. Yeah. So Big Barn Bed was good. Get on the Right Thing was a wonderful track, too. I mean, that was very memorable. That was a. That was uh, started during Ram, right? Uh, and I, of course, I love Little Lamb Dragonfly. How did I miss but another thing was, we always tried to get too much music on a side. You know, I remember one of our one of our albums had like twenty two min minutes on a side. 
you can't do that. It's got to be 18 if you want a big hot pressing of it. And so we would put too much stuff on it. Uh, loop, medley. Yeah, I mean, it could have been a better album. It could have been a better single album. It really could, looking back now. But, you know, 2020 hindsight is a luxury of... Uh... Yep. I always felt bad uh, for Denny Lane because I always thought I Would Only Smile was a brilliant song. Um, that even had hit written on it if it had been possibly thought of as a sig single, but it didn't. It got left on the floor, and that was the end yeah. of that. Yeah, I hear Denny's new album or his new show is great too. It's just him and his guitar and stories. Yep, I just saw him. Yeah, it's wonderful. God bless him, man. Yeah, he had the stories. I don't know what his stories are like, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're different than mine. Have, you, have your ears been ringing a lot lately, Denny, no. over the past couple of months? No, no I mean, all right. Well, he, stayed I... with us. he stayed with us on our farm up in Scotland. You know, we had Rekahi Farm Kilkenzie by Campbelltown. <laughs> and, uh, and it was very nice, you know, and, and Henry would stay, and every once in a while, Paul and Lynn would jump on the horses, and, and the kids would jump on the horse, and they'd come over, and we'd have dinner, and, you know, go through the fields, and it was... It was really sweet. Um, I paid sixty dollars a month wow. for a, a, a furnished farmhouse that that looked across into our, Northern Ireland. You know, it was brilliant. So when the the kind of money that I was making at the time went a long way in Scotland, but not so <laughs> far in London. <laughs> right. You have a unique story here, not just because you were in Wings, but at the very beginning of Wings, when Paul was starting his family. Yeah. So the band joined at that time and you really were a family on the farm yeah. a lot. Yeah. So there was a real closeness there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask with um, we were talking about Mila before and with Live and Let Die in the studio, you recorded that with an orchestra live. Yeah. Is that difficult to pull off? And is that uncommon to do? Uncommon. You... Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, but George's Air London was a George Martin's studio. Brilliant. You know, it had it had the floor was suspended on Austin car springs, so I was told, so that the walls and the floor never touched. And so it gave it a, a, a unique kind of sound quality. And the orchestra was a small orchestra, about 40 people. And I was in a drum booth where I had gobos or, or uh, what do you call those things? A little... Um, buffer a little, uh, a little soundproof wall yeah. uh, uh that went up on the sides and but the the front was open so the orchestra was here like the violins were over there the brass was over there ray cooper was playing percussion back in the corner and he had timpani da -da -da -broom, ba -da -da -broom, you know and he put uh -huh. the duck call on the reggae bits and stuff like that so, so I could hear the orchestra in my phones and live. So by the time we got in there, the band, we knew our parts because we'd learned them up at Paul's house. So when he wrote the song, we sat down and worked out everybody's parts. And he said, wow, that's great, man. That was easy. And we we were becoming a band. So he then sent that demo to George Martin. George put the orchestra parts together. So when we went into the studio, it was a matter of making sure the notes were right on all of the orchestra parts. So we did a couple of passes through the song to make sure that the, the sound was right, the notes were right. And then we did a couple of takes, and we, we'd had that thing in, I don't know, three, four takes. Wow. I know that we were in and out of the studio, complete, mixed everything in three hours. Yeah, they That's spent amazing. three hours on a drum sound today, you know, <laughs> yeah. three three days on a drum sound, you know, but it was it was so easily done because we everybody knew what they were doing and everybody stuck to the stuck to the part. And the, we had a good crew at, at Georgia's studio and then we were in and out of there in no time and. Well, not that's not only a great song, Live and Let Die, but that recording. It really does feel like everyone, the band and the orchestra is together. It, it feels is. like it has that whole sound to it. It's amazing. Yeah, it's live. 
Was that the last thing you recorded with Paul? Live and Let Die? You know, I've never been asked that question before. Because what when was that recorded, Alan? It was... Uh, well, that was... Um, August or something? Uh, that was October 19th. And the last thing that you did for um, Red Rose Speedway was Jazz Street, which was, well, in a, in a week of recording from November 26th to December 6th, 73. Did you mean oh. Alan? Did you mean oh, wait a minute. But 1972? Is... Sorry, yeah, sorry, 1972. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> 73 was when my father died, right? Uh, and I'd already just left the band, right? Yeah, that was For a rough the period time. before that. That probably was one of the last things we recorded, yeah, because I was wondering, um. You know, Helen Wheels was released as a single prior to Ben on the Run. Um, right. It was in the UK, it was strictly a single. Here it became part of the album. But maybe I was wondering if you had rehearsed Helen Wheels at all. Yeah, I remember playing all of those tunes. Yeah. Okay. And I wasn't. Oh, yeah, with all the. Tell you the truth. I mean, like, Band on the Run. This is another Living Let. Another Mary Had a Little Lamb to Me. It just didn't. It, as as well as it got dressed up in the recording and everything, it it just wasn't a piece of music like "Backseat of My Car" or uh, you know some of the, some of the epic pieces that Paul had written. But mm. Please don't tell him that. <laughs> so really, the, really, the last recordings you made uh, with Paul were the demos for "Band on the Run." Probably so. Yeah, you know, that was right up until uh, Henry quit. I think on a, August fourteenth. Yeah, and uh, it was close to two weeks later the, yep. the, they went to Lagos and then your father died on the, as you say, the 28th. Yeah. I think I was doing a Donovan album with, uh, yeah. Andrew Lou Goldham. When I got the word, I got home late in the, you know, in the morning after recording all day and, uh, that my father passed away. And then I went back to the States to, to be with my mom for a little bit, but then came back and did some more, stuff in london before we packed london in i did the the tommy opera with uh, lou reisner and, and the london symphony and rick wakeman and all those guys so that that was that was a, a great send-off and then i went home and I actually i did while i was in town i did some recording with joe cocker too over at battersea studios the old who's studio so and that was the last yeah and actually, I've been spending a lot of time with Stephen Stills. And uh, in 1975, just shortly after that, I did uh, a week with him for his wife, Veronique Sanson, and uh, at the Paris Olympic Olympia Theater with an orchestra, small orchestra, we recorded four nights for ORTF. I can't find any footage of that either. Mm. Or the... Uh, the, the the Rainbow Theater with the Finsbury Park Rainbow Theater with the, the Tommy Opera. I couldn't find any footage from that, and it was recorded. I know it was, but anyway, after at the end of the the Veronique Sanson gig with with Stevens at, at the time wife, he said, "Let's go up and and hang out with Paul and have dinner with them." And I said, "Yeah, I haven't seen him since I left the band, and there there felt like some animosity. I felt like I'd." left him down at a really poor time. So I call him up and he says, come on up. We'd love to see you. So we flew up and we had dinner with Paul and Linda and, uh, and it, it was a, a beautiful thing. You know? Oh, that's great. But there was, a, there was never, was there ever an opportunity where the door was at least cracked for you to return? No, yeah. I think when you, when you leave a situation that, that involves Paul McCartney, the door is not cracked. He shuts the door. Mm. That's the way I felt. This is my own personal feeling. But as time went on and I kind of uh, let him know how sorry I was for the way I left, when I left, and why I left, uh, was, I, I believe I'm the only guy from the past that still can call him and he picks up the phone. We're still friends, and he he's got a. We have a true friendship, and he really loves my wife. And my wife was not threatening at all, like most wives or um, band members' wives. You know, we were a family, and my wife used to hold Stella backstage, and 
and, and babysit the kids every once in a while. We we truly were. There was something very special there, and and I it, I'm glad that I be I was able to repair that. Hmm. I felt like it was repaired, and uh, you know I'm surprised now. He's been in town rehearsing for something. I don't know what it is, but he didn't call, and I, I feel left out. <laughs> Hey, I but, should remind you that she babysat them for the entire university tour. Um, yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. When they we're came, ready to go. And he says, Where's Monique? I said, Well, she's down at you know our place. And he said, Well, get her up here. We, you know, she's coming along. I said, Well, she didn't know that. So she finds somebody to the upstairs neighbor to keep our cat and jumped in a cab, threw some shit in a bag, and we left on the tour, you know. <laughs> yeah. But she didn't mind that. Uh it was, you know, the kids loved her. She loved the kids. The kids were great anyway. So, yeah. I just wanted to ask you, um, first of all, a few years ago, you were involved with this beauty. Oh, yeah. On, yeah. The tribute to Ram with Fernando Perdomo. You were talking about possibly doing tributes for wildlife and Red Rose Speedway. Is there any word on that? No, I, I didn't want to take it that far. I mean, uh, Fernando would like to do it, but... Uh, the Ram thing, uh, I heard what he did. He, he recorded a couple of tracks and said, please come up and put drums on these two tracks. Just it, I think it was uh, too many people and some people never know. So I said, all right, I'll, that was kind of the audition for him. He's very talented. He had a great little home studio. And, and he said, let's do the whole Ram album. I said, uh, Ram's a masterpiece. Why would we do that, first of all? And, he said that because this younger generation of musicians really wants to be a part of a, this project, they think that Ram is the best record ever made. Mm -hmm. And so I called Paul up and I said, what do you think? And he said, go ahead, have some fun with it. That's all I needed. So I said, all right, let's do it. And we did it. I mean, I did eight tracks one day in three hours. Um, it was just me playing along with a CD of the original album. So we got the exact same tempos, the exact same drummer. And then Fernando, and he was very good at adding the, the, the missing pieces. And we sent it around the world to different artists that wanted to be a part of it. So it was, it was a little disappointing the way the company handled it, because I don't think they did very well in promoting it in, in the United States. It might've sold pretty good in England, but it was way high up in the charts, but boy, we, it did not sell too much. And now it's available on a double album vinyl. Mm. So, And they're really hot pressings. They're, uh, the, the sound is extraordinary. On, on, so it's available. And it's, it's really, uh, my job was to keep the spirit of the original Ram. And, and so far as the, uh, the vocals that were chosen and the, the solos and, we even had a couple of, you know, the Dave Spinoza played the original guitar that he used on Just Another Day and the right. original part. And Marvin Stam did his uncle, Uncle Albert Brattle, did, 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 did his flugelhorn part. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. I had a couple of ringer buddies of mine put some parts on uh, Davy Johnstone from Elton's band and, oh, sure. and uh, Joey Santiago from the Pixies and <laughs> put some really beautiful. But it was mainly these kids that I didn't know, kids, you know, but younger generation artists. And uh, they did such a terrific job that the hardest part was we had three people singing on the track. And I had to listen to three vocals and say, no, nah, that one's got it. These two, sorry. So mm -hmm. it was, those kind of choices were hard, but it was fun to make, I must say. But I don't want to make a career out of redoing everything I did with Early Wings. That's... It seems a little shady. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking because in in recent years there's been a, a growing appreciation for Paul's early solo music pre band on the run. Yeah, more people are appreciating Red Rose Speedway and Wildlife. Yeah, so I was thinking maybe because of that, maybe you might want to do a tribute to those albums too. But well, maybe Fernando will, but I don't know if I I want to do that again. Yeah. Okay. And what about the, the Denny Sywell trio? This was your... Well, we have uh, the guy... Yeah, yeah, I'll give you a better Most one. recent. Mine doesn't glare. I got a mouse pad. So <laughs> do I. I have one too. Uh, 
Yeah, Joe Bag, our organist, uh, moved up to Portland, so I have a new guy named named Kerry Frank, and uh, I, I'm really excited about the, the the new version of the trio. It's a little bit more listener friendly, not quite so jazz infused, hmm. yet it touches all the right bases. But it's got more groove, kind of like Steve Gadd band and what have you, and. And uh, and I just love playing with an organ. Organ, guitar, and drums is is such a nice palette for a drummer like myself musically. So uh, we're 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 trying to book some now that the COVID seems to be for the most part it's it's a thing of the past out here in LA. We're going we're going to try to book some more uh, shows around town. And and I still got a record company that believes in us. So Quarter Valley Records is is uh, my label and. Uh, you know, I would like to do, I'd like to play, you know, hit a couple of new places maybe and figure out a way that I could record an album live over a period of two or three nights of live recording. And it'd be a lot easier to do than in a studio. And uh, that would be a nice way to, to present the trio too. Mm -hmm. Any so, chance of coming to the East Coast? Uh I, I'd love to. Right now, I'm dealing with a health issue. I haven't been on an airplane uh, due to my I have a breathing issue that's that's that's, that's tough. But I'm getting through it. I'm just a little. Uh, I'm afraid that I had a private jet offered me to fly up to San Francisco and do a gig, and I said that's all right. I'll drive. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to deal with that. Though I want to be able to fly. I'd like to go back to Europe one more time, but take my wife back to France one more time. And I, and I miss New York. I really love to go to New York, but mm. if, uh, you know, the last time the trio was back there, we did a Beatle fast and then we mm. played the Iridium. We played the cutting room and then we went up to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, right next to where I was from. And then the opera house up there was a great, uh, stop on the, uh, the national jazz tour and, we broke all records because my senior class came out <laughs> to see me again, you know, so many years later. But, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be able to do that one more time. We'd love to see you. Yeah, Please let us absolutely. know if you come into the East Coast. I certainly will. As soon as something like that. Right now, I just got to get my mind right that I can get on a plane. Hey, I'll I drive you by car. I'll, I'll drive you all the way across the country yeah. if I have to. I wanted to close, close say something here as we reach the end um, um, of of what an honor it is getting to to meet you and speak with you uh, here. Um, and I've said this many times on this show that um, the soundtrack to my growing up was provided by Wings. Yeah, uh, I'm 58, nice. so I was eight. They didn't tell me math was going to be involved in this. I was, eight, <laughs> I was eight years old when Red Rose Speedway came out, and that was my first McCartney album. I had the, I had it, and still have the Apple cassette of of Red Rose Speedway, and listening to it over and over again on my little mono Zenith tape recorder, it was a uh, a huge part of my youth. And and I want to thank you for oh, be, thank being you. on those recordings and being part of. Um, see, look what you created today. Look at this. Look at me yeah. over here. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, but thank you, Denny, and and oh, and it God. means so much to get to talk to you, especially about Red Rose Speedway. Well, thank you, Darren. I mean, that's really nice of you, and it is. It's an honor to be a part of that slice of history. Yeah. It's uh, you know. A lot of bands just don't get that much, you know, when make a record that's still being loved and played and and everything 50 some years later. I mean, yep. so I, I'm very fortunate. And I also want to thank you not only for being a guest here, but on behalf of Alan and Darren and all the fans who love the McCartney legacy <laughs> book. Um, thank you and Monique for for uh, lending the two authors there, your diaries yeah. from that time period, because we have probably the most accurate account of that time period because yeah. of, of uh, the two of you. So well, thank you and Monique. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say as well, because I don't know, Alan, we did meet before, though, haven't we? Um, yeah, well, 
you've been on the show before. Um, yeah, right. That's right. The time I've been in it, um, but we weren't doing video in those days. Yeah. Right. Right. When we, because... did, uh, when we did the interviews for the book, I think I interviewed you first, and then Adrian wanted to talk to you as well, and then the the two of you did like three or four more interviews. Right. Yeah, that's what it was. And, and... well, please send my regards to him and congratulations on the book. You know. The, the little bit that I've had time to go through just look very special. You know, yeah, if, if you are if you're a Wings fan or even a Beatle fan, it's definitely uh, the epitome of it. You don't get a better version of, of what, what really happened in those days. And, 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 and thank, thank my wife for keeping such good records and, Absolutely. and find, we're mm-hmm. still trying to look for, we had it all written down someplace and, that we can't find the little diary for for 1971. It's around the house here somewhere. We've spent hours looking for it, but it'll turn up one of these days. <laughs> yes, we'll thank then, you, us, and, uh, and I'll 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 give your best to Adrian. And, yes. and w- when you find that, then Alan and Adrian will have to have a revised. Well, no, they got the goods out of it. We put it, <laughs> we put it away after we did the interviews. Oh, we yeah. put it away for safekeeping. Okay. Where did we put it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought we had all the seventy one stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. If you were still living in London, I'd say check behind the uh, toilet tank. Behind yeah, Thomas Crapper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Well, thanks, guys. Thank and you, Danny. Thank you so much. much. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and uh, you know, keep it going, man. Keep keep the music alive, man. Okay. Thanks. Thank thanks you. For making- you. See you next time. Yep. Bye, Danny. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. So that was a lot of fun. Great having Denny Sywell around, uh, you know, talk to us, tell us what was going on in Red Rose Speedway and other things. Uh, he's hasn't been on the show for a very long time and um, good to have him again. Yeah. Absolutely. He's always, he's always a great guest. Yeah. And for the most part, it's got great memories, mm-hmm. sharp memories for, for that time period. Which, yeah. as we said, was yeah, it's over fifty years ago now. So, right. yeah. a lot of this stuff. Yep. So we should go around and uh, tell everyone how to get in touch with us. Of course, the um, the info is in the text box under the uh, the YouTube version or the Podbean version, and uh, yeah. So, but we'll we'll tell you briefly anyway. So, start with Darren. All right. Uh, you're going to catch me on the radio on WFUV. I'm on the air Monday through Thursday nights, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Uh, and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. WFUV is in New York City at 90.7 FM. And um, you can also listen on our website where we stream at WFUV.org. And we have an app you can download and uh, listen to us on the app as well that that's pretty handy and look for me on facebook that's the best way to keep in touch with me individually i have two facebook pages one is just darren devivo send me a friend request the other is uh, uh i guess it's a page so you click like or follow or whatever and uh, that one is darren devivo um and it has a longer name i never remember what it's what it's called but uh you'll find me there get on one page and i'll link you to the other one uh and um uh, and that's that okay ken a lot of things going on my youtube channel which is called ken michaels radio uh recently i did a, i did another ultimate beatles music trivia show so far there's four of them on there and uh each of them last about a half hour long i have three contestants on and they all battle each other for their knowledge of Beatle and solo Beatle music and history. And uh, if you're familiar with um, the trivia questions and the games that I put on my website and that I've had on my radio show, Every Little Thing, it's just a continuation of that. Only it's a half hour's worth of it. And it's a lot of fun. And so if you can, check that out. Test your own knowledge on the Beatles uh, with those shows. I just did a brand new interview with the author, Michael Ventrella, who just put out this brand new book called The Beatles on the Charts. It's got all the information here on the Beatles group and solo recordings. There's singles and albums on the Billboard charts, where everything peaked, how many weeks they spent, how they rank overall 
in their entire history, singles and albums, what's the biggest single? That what's the least handy. successful? What's that? That is handy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, if you remember the book altogether now, which we always bring up every now and then, which was an incredible resource for Beatles fans when it first came out in 1975, they had towards the back of the book, they had the Billboard charts and they listed what was on the charts week by week, which is cool. Because certainly yeah. in the 60s and 1964 in particular, there were so many Beatles singles that were on the charts the same week. It told you where each song was week by week. This does the exact same thing towards the end of the book from 1964 all the way to the end of uh, 2021. The singles and the albums. And so that includes uh, when the archival box sets came out on the Beatles and on Paul and if they made the charts or not or the John Lennon box sets, or All Things Must Pass. If it's on the charts, if it made Billboard, it's in here. So we talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about the major gripes I have <laughs> with the charts and some of the problems, uh, how they change the rules a bit. But, um, you know, it's a fun book. And if you're a chart buff, you will love that book. That's for sure. I also interviewed Chris Englehart. I've mentioned Chris a number of times. This is his latest book, Beatles Fully Uncovered. And he talks about Beatles side projects in there, songs they wrote for other people, played on or produced for other people. And we each gave our own list of what we feel are the best in each category. And so that was a really nice interview. And I just interviewed a few days ago, Luca Parasi, who has just put out this new book, Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas. And this is another great resource book. And it gathers together information about every single song that Paul released, whether he wrote them or not, the cover versions too, like Love is Strange or whatever. And um, any information about each song, whether it comes from Paul, band members of Wings, other people involved with the records, um, it's all in here. And um, a lot of it, comes from the McCartney legacy, you know, I must say, because I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of quotes in there and um, information on when certain songs are recorded. It really is a great layout overall because I love looking up each song. It'll tell you the very beginning, backing tracks recorded this day in this studio. And then when it was picked up on, when it was finished, which studios were used, if they change studios at all. With the McCartney legacy, as you know, everything is more like day by day. So if you like reading it that way and you can feel like you're living it <laughs> with Paul and with Wings or whatever, there's nothing better than that. It's kind of like the Mark Lewison approach, like I, you know, I said. That book, but uh, uh, um, Music is Ideas is, is more of a reference kind of reference It's book. a reference book, but it's packed with information. You know, if you like... Um, you know, there's a book a long time ago called Beatles Songs, and it just lists every song that was released from the core catalog of the Beatles, and it's broken down chronologically. And every bit of information that they have for each Beatles song, whether it's a quote from a Beatle, a quote from George Martin, somebody else in the music industry, it's all packed song by song there. This is the same approach with Paul. And this book, by the way, takes you from uh, the 70s and 80s all the way to the end of 1989. And Luke is going to do another book where he'll take you all the way to the present. And hopefully that'll be coming out next year. But we talked for over an hour about uh, the 70s. We're going to do a two-part interview, first on the 70s, second on the 80s. Hopefully, maybe in a month from now, we'll talk about the 80s, Paul. But uh, great book to have there from Luca Parasi, Music is Ideas. And that line comes from, of course, Talk More Talk. Right. The very intro there of Talk More Talk. So that's all on my um, YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. A lot going on there. Another new trivia show recorded tomorrow. So if you love the trivia stuff, there's more of that coming. Uh, if you can, please subscribe. My radio program, Every Little Thing. The newest show has a thematic set of Ryman song titles. Like Sneaking Sally Through the Alley and... More smooth than the gray goose. Um, there there's also <laughs> that's a different Paul. Um, also, the tribute song for George Harrison is in there. 
from Legs Larry Smith. If you want to listen to every little thing, the easiest way is to go to WFDU's website where they archive my shows uh, the last two weeks worth. Uh, go to WFDU.FM and type in every little thing in the show title in the archives page, and you'll see two files there that you can play. My website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, giving away all these, so many of these great books, The McCartney Legacy, the Chris Englehart book. Pretty soon I will have um, Luca Parasi's book here to give away and Michael Ventrella's book. Um, and because, well, in celebration of Denny Sywell spending time with us, I have one copy left of the last Denny Sywell Trio CD, which is called Boomerang. And they do cover Live and Let Die on here. So you can win that on my website, on my Beatles Trivia and Games page. It's Beatles Trivia every week. Go hit the Beatles Trivia and Games tab on the homepage. It'll lead you right there. And then uh, finally, the other podcast show that I co-host, Talk More Talk. Next Sunday, May 1st, uh, we'll be doing a, a tribute, uh, a retrospective look at uh, this album called Red Rose Speedway. Mm -hmm. 50th anniversary. Another show on it. <laughs> I'm glad that it's getting all this attention. This is such an incredible year for anniversaries. So, Does it seem to you that like in the same way that some years back, all of a sudden it seemed that the opinions switched for Ram and Ram is now held yeah. in such high regard that that's starting to happen for Red Rose Speedway now? Well, not as much as Ram, but it's no, getting it more just appreciated. Seems to, I'm hearing so much positivity around the album that... Yeah. Was you know it was just a you know whether you liked it or not it was a good McCartney and Wings album but it was one of the many and it didn't get the attention probably it's just the anniversary but it just seems like uh, Red Rose Speedway is getting a little bit more um, you know time if, yeah these days well you know there's like anniversaries put things back in the public eye and ear and it it may sort of get people who never listen to it at all to say, Hey, you know, that's, and it, and it may, it may catch up with Ram who knows, you know, it's, it's yeah. imponderables of public taste. Part of the reason why these archival box sets are so important is because as they come out, then it gets a lot of attention right. and there's articles written about it and reviews about it. And people go back and listen to this stuff. And I've always had this mantra that, uh, you know, the opinions that we have, on music are never permanent. Things can always change. Mm -hmm. An album that you didn't think highly of long ago, all of a sudden you could appreciate maybe as you get older. You yeah. know, nobody knew when Ram came out in 1971 that people would be respecting it the way that they do now. You know, and uh, I love Press to Play as an album. And a lot of people think that's very tied in with the 80s sound. Who knows what people are going to be saying 10 years from now or 20 years from now about press to play that's the nature of art of all kinds so that's the fascinating thing about you know sharing our opinions in the moment but you never know what people are going to be saying in the future right, right. okay so right. you can reach me um probably through facebook is your best bet um either alan cozen or alan cozen remix we all seem to have two pages and in fact the group has two pages things we said today and the things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And the show gets posted on both of them or links to the YouTube version, which is, uh, you know, for us, the preferred version because um, it's video, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so otherwise you can follow us on Twitter at, at Things We Said Fab. And we have an email address where you can write to all of us um propose show ideas which people have been doing it's been great in fact you know we'll have to mm. we'll have to have a chat about some of those um or just your comments about the show whatever you want and that is things we said today radio show at gmail.com okay so just take a quick second to say that alan mentioned the two facebook pages um, I'm going to be closing those two pages at some point soon with a new replaced with a new page. So just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll let you know more when that happens. 
really, you know, yeah. Can I add one more thing? Sure. I just want to thank everybody listening and watching to this show who came to see us at the Fest for Beetle Fans. Yeah. We had an absolute blast doing our panel there. Yep. And um, it's nice to see everybody meet them in person, especially after, I know we had one last year, but, you know, because of COVID, we couldn't see a lot of you guys. And we got to meet a lot of you. And um, just thank you for being there and supporting supporting us on this show as we're doing it bi-weekly and uh, when you come to see us. Okay, so for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.